Uh, I'm Keisuke uh, from Johns Hopkins, and thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be here at AI2, and also I'm very excited to uh, talk, uh, talking about my research titled Robust Text Correction for Grammatical, uh, for Grammar and Fluency. Okay, so um, this is a kind of joint work with my uh, advisors, Ben Van Dermi and Matt Post, and great collaborators, Kevin Du, Courtney Polis, and Joel Tetro. Okay, um, so here's a very um, high level picture in NLP. Um, we are trying to, in NLP, we are trying to build uh, models that um, takes textual input as an X and predict some output Y. And so on the left hand side, we, are, we have users and on the, right, on the right hand side, we have some model. So for example, um, if you take a sentence and we predict a sentiment, this is a kind of sentiment analysis. And sometimes we want a part of a speech levels, like a, more like a sequence labeling task. And sometimes we want a structured um, output, like uh, constituency uh, plus tree or dependency tree. Or sometimes we want um, sentence as an output. This is more like machine translation setting. Or sometimes we have some document and the query as an input, and we are going to um, uh, search some answer. So this is a kind of standard QA or reading comprehension setting. And so there are many examples. The last example here is that um, we have a pair of sentences as an input, and predict um, if the the sentence and uh, the hypothesis is some relationship about entailment. So this is stand, uh, natural language inference task. Um, so in most cases, however, um, we are assuming that the input texts are uh, very grammatical and fluent. So we sometimes um, extract text from news or books, uh, something like that, and they are grammatical and fluent. And we are training a model on this kind of clean data. Um, however, uh, in this real world, um, if you look at the real world, we, there are many uh, noisy text. Uh, for example, uh, we have OCR books, and there are many um, minor errors in spelling, uh, recognition errors, or social media text, uh, which is um, very popular now. Um, the, the amount of data is huge. And uh, there are also non-native speakers writing. Um, and more recently, we have some text uh, from um, speech recognition uh, from a home speaker or something. So. Um, all of these languages are not always grammatical and fluent, and the model performance uh, gets uh, always lower than the clean text in these cases. Um, as a result, uh, sometimes uh, some serious troubles may happen. Uh, so in this case, this is the last um, uh, October, I guess. Yeah, last o October, uh, the Facebook mistranslated someone's post uh, says he's saying good morning uh, in, I guess it's uh, Hebrew or Arabic, I forgot. But uh, the, the guy was arrested because of the, the, the post was translated as uh, attack them or hurt them. So the, the, that guy was arrested in an innocent post. So this is a very serious problem. I don't want that kind of happening to me. And also there is another uh, recent paper uh, coming up to the ICLR, ICLR this here, um, saying that the synthetic and natural noise both break neural machine translation. And um, I think this is not, this is going to be bad for other NLP uh, areas. For example, uh, if we want to extract some knowledge um, like open IE style, um, this is also going to be uh, very problematic. So uh, the goal here is um, to build NLP models that are robust like, like humans. Okay, um, so here is the outline of this talk. Um, it's very simple. Uh, we uh, start from character level error correction, then move on to the uh, token level error correction, and finally I'm going to talk about uh, sentence or phrase level error correction. Okay, um, so uh, let's start with the first part. And this part is originally um, presented at AAAI last year. By the way, if you have any questions and comments, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Okay. So uh, 
I want to start with this example from psycholinguistics. Um, this shows actually amazing robustness of human uh, reading ability. So I'll give you uh, some, some time, uh, maybe 10 or 50 seconds. Uh, so could you uh, read this text a little bit? So I think most of you have already read it. So this example clearly shows that the human brain is so good at handling robust input uh, compared with the computers. Actually, uh, in the title of this paper was also including um, the robust, uh, no, the, this kind of intentional typos. And actually, during, during the conference, no, not so many people actually realized it, uh, except uh, some people uh, like uh, Thomas Dietrich, um, he noticed that uh, intentional um, spelling errors, and he tweeted like uh, this way, um, which was a little bit, uh, which was uh, kind of nice. Um, but anyway, um, so the, this example shows that um, the robustness of human brain, and the, the question as a NLP research or engineering question is that can we build up computational model that replicates this kind of robustness? And here's the model I propose uh, called semi-character recurrent neural network. Uh, the abbreviation is SCRNN. Uh, this is actually a very simple model. And we, I just followed the uh, uh, hypothesis that psycholinguists said. So um, for the input token, uh, I represented as X sub N. I decomposed the input token into three uh, subcomponents, B, I, B, I, and N. Uh, e, sorry. So B stands for the beginning of the token. So this is one hot vector for the first character. And I sub N is, oh, sorry, that's, I will go with E sub N first. So E is ending the last character represented by one hot, one hot vector of the token. And I sub N is the bag of characters of the internal characters. So, so for example, the word university is represented as, as as like this. So the B is taking care of the first character, and E is taking care of the last character, and we have um, the bag of characters for the internal <coughs> characters. Okay. And so we feed this input to an LSTM, and the LSTM is um, expected to predict a correct word in the vocabulary. So in this case, uh, we have some noisy token as an input and decomposed into three pieces and concatenate them together again and feed it in LSTM and the model is predicting the correct um, word from a vocabulary. And so this is a kind of un unfold uh, picture of the LSTM so we feed uh, a token at a time. Oh, I jumped to the... Okay. So, um, so we actually ran several experiments. The first exper experiment is uh, spelling correction um, in which I used a pen tree bank and the parameters are set as follows. And for the baselines, uh, I compared my model with some standard spelling checkers, like uh, uh, ancient open source spelling checker, some commercial products. I'm not going to say the exact product here, but uh, and uh, I also compared with um, character-based uh, recurrent neural language model um, that was proposed in uh, 2016. And that model contains some uh, convolutional uh, layer inside of it. Um, okay. All right, so uh, during test time, uh, actually we tested three noise types. The first noise type is jumble, uh, in which I mix uh, sh randomly shuffle internal characters like we saw in the, in the beginning. And I also set some deletion, uh, which delete one character randomly. And insert is simply like inserting one character into a into token. Okay, so, so here's the result. And uh, so actually our model achieved very high accuracy in three uh, conditions compared with the, the baselines. Um, so this is kind of nice. So what, what are you training on? Oh, okay. So you're training on the pen tree bank. Mm -hmm. um, so if, I, if 
Oh, I see. Um, so I created artificial test set. Um, during training, actually, the, the model doesn't care um, the actual spelling because the internal characters are always um, shuffled or treated as like uh, k-hot vectors. But for the test set, I yeah, generated an artificial test set. Uh, the predict the correct spelling, a uh, correct word at the time. It's, instead of predicting uh, next word, uh, we are predicting a correct word at the time. Sure, go ahead. Why can you get uh, auto capella M, correct word, but auto capella M? Uh, OV, okay. Uh, so in this setting, I OOV, uh, I set the the size of vocabulary to be 10,000. And if the token is a kind of out of vocabulary, it produces some wrong word at that, uh, during the test time. Oh, that makes sense. So if you got really words with similar spelling, mm -hmm. that's what I think you got. So, okay. so it, yeah, it has different meaning, but yeah, like it has really, really similar spelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good question about especially explaining why we have low, a slightly lower performance on delete. So exa for example, think about it, uh, if the input is mess or miss or mass, if we delete one character from it, the, sometimes the other words get into MSS. So in that case, it's more difficult to recover the correct spelling. Although we have some context information in the, in the model, but still, um, the frequency is very strong, uh, really affecting that part. So that's why, uh, sorry, that's why I got the slightly lower performance on that. So am I answering your question? Uh, okay. I guess uh, one thing I would notice, this, this is like a remarkably simple model, right? These test models are very, very complex and the, 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 the amount of gains you get is a lot. And it also seems like you have if anything, stripped away information. So you're, you're almost, you have a bag of character representation except the first and last identified, mm -hmm. instead of, um, which is less information than just giving the input word. Yes. So what's your intuition that, um, is it that you have, you have brought in your, I guess, psycholinguistic mm -hmm. analysis to, to take out the distracting stuff and only keep what's important? Um, mm -hmm. Like in principle, you could imagine the if you had tons and tons of data, the system could learn that that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. I need to look at the first and last characters, and I should just mix up all the initial words and the in yeah. intermediate letters. Uh, and I guess you are hand holding it a little bit by providing mm -hmm. that input. Yes. Yeah. Do you think it would work if a regular system would just learn to do this if you had lots of data? Because you, you can generate lots of data, right? You, you're synthetically generating this. Yes. Take any sentence and yes. generate it. Yeah, um, so you are asking me if we can change the model so that I can just looking at the bug of characters. And yeah, uh, for, uh, or do you think a simple model that actually takes the characters in the order mm -hmm. of a word, would it learn to do what you got it to do if uh, without the architecture kind of forcing that, if you had uh, lots of data? I see, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, maybe I can talk it to offline because I think it's not. Mm -hmm. Or maybe. Your uh, question is, might be related to my second experiment following that slide. Um, I saw some. Uh, uh, yeah, just a clarification question. Are the other uh, trainable systems also trained to generate the uh, oh, Sorry, uh, what's the question? You're using training for any data set for other systems. For the other systems? Uh, oh, yes, yep. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I, I forked the, uh, the source code from the the Kim's model, and I trained on the same data set. And, but for commercial, like, uh, these three uh, spelling checkers are just, I um, use the off the shelf. Okay. Uh, oh, right, go ahead. Do you have a sense of how the performance changes are based on the amount of words that you introduce? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, um, I honestly, I just tested on these three conditions, but I haven't tried the amount of noise and the performance. 
in decrease. Um, but that's a good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. good point yeah. Oh, always, all the tokens. Mm -hmm. So for example, yeah, uh, as, as we saw in the, at the beginning of that talk, um, the older words are almost uh, noised. So here's an example of the first example I showed before and the output from each model. And as you can see that the, our model always, almost always um, correctly um, predicted the correct word whereas the other models um, failed um, sometimes. Especially the character level model failed very tragically because they are looking at character by character. Um, they are feeding character by character. So it's, it's, it's the, the data is not consistent um, for a word. Okay, uh, so the, in the second experiment, um, I wanted to know um, which position is more important or how, how about we can just looking at the bug of characters instead of splitting the first and ending, first and the last character. So I, uh, so this is the same model from experiment one, and I made some three uh, variants. Uh, the first one, first variant is just fixing the last character and treated the rest of them as a bug of characters, and this is the other way around, and this is treating the older characters as a bug of characters. So and so this is how it looks like. Um, so int is like internal shuffle, and end is uh, the the first character is fixed. So sorry, this is a little bit confusing. The end is ending. The word ending is subject to be shuffled. Okay, and big and and all it looks like this. And here's the result about the loss. Oh, sorry, the s is missing here. But maybe you can retrieve it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, it is not that surprising that we see that the uh, int is the easiest and the lowest er uh, lowest loss, and all got all this condition got the most difficult, like, uh, highest loss. But uh, it is interesting to see that um, the end condition is easier than um, the beginning condition. So that means that the first character is more important than the last one for the model. And actually, this is, it is more interesting that if we um, compare with um, reading time by human eye tracking experiment, uh, we found a very similar uh, trend uh, to, the, to, the, to our model. So in, in this case, I just extracted from the previous psycholinguistics experiment, then they found that ending is much easier uh, reading than the, the, this beginning condition. So, okay. So, so this means that the model replicates human reading uh, process, at least partially. Or in other words, this the SCRNN model uh, or something similar is implemented in our brain. Okay, uh, so this is the first part. Um, and I'm gonna move on to the uh, word level error correction. But before that, do you have any questions? So, mm -hmm. um, so the, this part is originally presented at uh, ACL last summer. Um, the title is Error Repair Dependency Parsing for Ungrammatical Text. Um, so just a quick reviewing about dependency parsing. I think I don't need this uh, for, for you guys, but uh, just, in, just all make all, all of us on the same ground. So the dependency parsing is a task where we take a sentence as an input and predict a tree structure as an output. So like this, sometimes labels are required, but sometimes are not. Uh, however, um, we are interested in noisy text uh, as an input, or just I am interested in noisy text as an input. And so what if um, the input had grammatical errors and we are ask, asked to do dependency parsing on that sentence? Um, conventionally, uh, the error correction has been treated as a kind of pre-processing, and we have doing this kind of pipeline um, approach. But my question is um, whether we can do this jointly. So that means we can correct errors and do dependency parsing jointly at the same time. 
And I proposed a model called, um, I just named uh, error repair dependency parsing. Um, the, there are two key ideas. Uh, the first idea comes from the Goldberg and El Haddad algorithm called uh, non-directional easy first parsing. And the second key idea is uh, three new actions to uh, repair errors. I'm going to explain one by one. So for those who are not familiar with the, um, the non-directional easy first parsing, uh, let me explain it briefly with uh, this box for example. So suppose we are given this sentence. So what this algorithm is doing is first we uh, put all the tokens into a pending list. And, and then we add neighboring edges as a kind of candidates. And they are called either um, attach right or attach left. And then we iteratively choose an um, edge until we complete, we can build a complete pass tree. So let's do a, also yeah, let's do a walkthrough here. Um, so let's say the brown fox is kind of a dependency, uh, the, 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 that it is very likely to be there is a dependency. Oh, by the way, um, the, this notation is like the arc is um, from child to head. Sorry, this is my, this might be a little, the other way around from the standard. But the original Goldberg paper is following this notation, so I just I'm showing this here. So let's choose uh, attach right here. So and what go what's going to happen is that we are going to remove the token, the child token, from the pending list. And what we're going to do next is choosing another, the next, um, like a mo most likely edge at this time. And we choose attach right here. And we remove the token from the pending list. And let's choose attach left between these tokens and remove the child. And let's just keep going until one token is left. And uh, when we got one token, uh, we can attach it to the root. And we have. Um, dependency pass tree as an output. So this is how the non-directional easy first parsing works. But um, as I said, we are interested in correcting errors at the same time. So uh, what, what we've done is adding three new actions in, in addition to attach left or attach right. We added three new kinds of actions. The substitute and substitute, delete, and insert. So this is a kind of uh, simple, like a substitute is replacing a token in a pending list into something else. And delete is deleting a token in a pending list. And insert is going to insert a token into a pending list. OK, so um, let's walk through these new actions in, uh, in this example. So again, um, we add neighboring edges as like we did before for the non-directional uh, non easy first parsing. We have attach right and attach left here. And now we have new actions to take. Um, substitute, delete, or insert. So um, that I'm uh, writing is like a, this kind of circular arrows. Okay, um, so, and then let's choose attach right to the first two tokens and Again, we remove the list. Uh, we remove the token from the list. And again, yeah, we do this. So let's try um, our new action, substitute. So looking at the surrounding context, the, we can decide, we can choose what kind of um, word is better than here. And in this case, we choose uh, hearing is better than here, according to the surrounding context. So now we change the token. And let's, let's take delete uh, in this case. And we just simply remove the in from the pending list. And when we choose insert action, uh, we are going to insert a token before this word. Okay. And we just keep going, uh, keep choosing attach left, attach right, or some new actions until we get the, the first three is complete. Okay, so I, I just skipped the, all the rest of the walkthrough. So uh, the next question is uh, how to uh, train the parser? Uh, in other words, how to tell which action is good at this at some some time? And for attach left and attach right, um, the the original paper already proposed 
um, that the edge is good or valid. They called the, the proposed edge is, edge is valid if the edge is in a gold parse and the child already uh, has its own children. So that means, um, suppose, so once we uh, attach left or attach, do, once we do attach left or attach right, the token cannot be add, the token, we cannot add any children to this token. So before doing uh, attach left or attach right, all the children should be attached to this token. So that, that's what it means. So that this means, okay. And for, for these two actions, it's easy because just we copied the same um, uh, uh, judgment. And for new actions, we ha also have to define what, which action is good, and if the substitution is good or bad during training. Um, so we define the validity or goodness as follows. Um, the, if the edge, is, uh, the edge is valid or good, if the proposed action decreases the, the word edit distance to the uh, gold sentence. So if we do an action, like substitute, delete, or insert, and do, if the action makes the edit distance closer to the reference, we can say that the action was pretty good. Uh, if the edit distance goes to, uh, if the edit distance increased, uh, we are doing something bad toward the correct sentence. So this is how we define the validity of the action. Okay, so uh, now we are, I think, ready to personalize the text. But uh, <laughs> maybe you, some of you realize that there's a question mark. Um, so there's actually a caveat in the test time. Um, actually, that we introduced in three new actions, but they introduce actually um, the, some infinite loops. Uh, for example, we can do infinite substitutions during test time because we don't know the correct or incorrect actions during test time. Or we can do insert, deletion, insert, deletion in many, many times, and uh, we cannot finish the parsing. So uh, to avoid these kind of infinite loops, uh, we added uh, some heuristic constraints. And the first one is simply just, uh, we just limit the number of new actions. So up to some amount of new actions. Uh, after that, we only we can only choose either attach left or attach right. And the second uh, constraint is the substitution is, um, substitution, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, substitution is applied once to the token. So, so the, the same token cannot be substituted many times. All right. So uh, let's move on to the um, experiments. Uh, so here are some details. Um, so I used, again, uh, Pantry Bank uh, for the first experiment. And the uh, errors are injected by the script made by Forster and Anderson. Uh, so this, the script is trying to generate um, artificial <coughs> grammatical errors, which is kind of mimicking the statistics, uh, which is uh, kind of following the statistics of language learners' uh, essay. And uh, we focused five most frequent grammatical errors. Um, we have terminal errors, prepositions, um, noun number errors, verb forms, and subject verb agreement errors. And for evaluation, we used the unlabeled, unlabeled attachment score, and the baseline is the pipeline approach. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, for the original action, do you allow any substitutions or only substitutions with words with the same letter? Yes, uh, that's a very good point. So uh, actually, I, I didn't explain it explicitly, but so when we target this, as an error types, yeah. um, the substitution action is only allowing the change within this class. So in that case, the, if the verb is a subject to be substitute, we can only allow the different verb, verb form, like here to hearing or here to heard, and things like that. And for similar, similarly for prepositions, we only allow to uh, substitute like into. Um, on or something into by. So you're doing insertion. Uh, you have some sense of that. Oh uh, yes. Any, any word in the language. Uh, yes. Uh, so for insertion, uh, we only allow insert determiner or position into. Oh, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it's really hard to like a search space. 
um, is getting super big and it's very really hard to track. But that's a very good point. Actually, this is a one like a hand wavy point in my model. Okay. So uh, here is the result for the experiment. Um, so the x-axis here is the error rate in the test time. So I change the error rate for the test time. So as we increase the error rate in the test time, the more difficult the parser get, a parser can do parsing. So that's it's usually the curve is getting like decreasing. Uh, but what we found is that um, the pipeline approach uh, decreases very sharply when we add more errors, whereas um, the joint model uh, decreases um, less sharply. That means that uh, when we add more errors, the, the joint model is more robust over the pipeline approach. Um, I see. I think um, so. During the joint model, we can look at um, more rich uh, or more broad range of features. Um, the baseline is actually doing uh, like five window and ground based um, features. As I can, so for for example, if we want to correct proportion errors, we are building classifier uh, that looks at some surrounding where it's a two or plus two or minus two um, uh, features. But in joint model, we can look at these child information and next word or previous word and the previous word part of the speech. So I think we can look at more rich feature in a joint model that makes the difference uh, here. Okay. Um, the so uh, we trained four different uh, models by changing the error injection rate during training. So I also changed the error injection rate uh, during training. But uh, basically, uh, what we found is that there is a similar trend. So if we add smaller error, small amount of error during training, the, the curves look very similar to the pipeline. So the more errors in the data set, we have um, the parser is going to learn many more patterns of errors. Okay, um, so in the in the second experiment, we tested um, improvement of grammaticality on the real uh, language learners corpus uh, because the first experiment is testing on artificial errors uh, injected into Pentry Bank and re reviewers didn't like it, so <laughs> I ran uh, the experiment on the real uh, language learners essay and to see how grammaticality is improved by the model. And the grammaticality score is computed by the Mike Hellman's uh, regression model. Uh, he's, he was in, at EDS um, and I, he was a mentor when I was in, during, I did an internship at EDS a couple of years ago. So I just used that model. Okay, so, and here's the result on the second experiment. Again, uh, we evaluated uh, four different uh, models. Uh, so I changed the error injection rate during training. And so it is not surprising that if we add small amount of uh, noises, uh, the, the grammaticality improvement, the improvement of grammaticality is not that much. Whereas uh, if we train on the more errors during training, we got a statistically significant improvement. Okay, go ahead. So this is by training on the error rate? Oh, that's a good point. Uh, actually, I didn't do this. Yeah. Um, uh, you mean the mixture rate per sentence or like the more? Yeah, yeah, I think in the real language learner corpus, I think the error rate varies sentence by sentence. So it's more realistic. I think your suggestion is more realistic. But uh, I, I didn't do that in, in, the, in my experiment. Okay, uh, so that's, oh, okay, go ahead. You mean the other, other domains like yeah, social media? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, that's a 
Yeah, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, I have never thought about it, but uh, well, yeah, if we can take neural uh, idea into this model, what we can do first is to, actually this parser is trained on a uh, stand, uh, conventional sparse feature based um, classifiers, but we can make the features to be neural so that it's going to be more flexible to other domains. And we can also change the, oh, we can also change the scope of the errors. Um, but uh, for example, in social media text, maybe we can, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to define the scope of the errors. So because sometimes people abbreviate words into many very small, uh, short words. And I think the, error, the variation of errors are slightly different. So um, I think the most difficult point is to designing the scope of this error. And maybe neural model can handle those kind of um, issues more flexibly because it's, it's uh, we, the neural model can represent almost everything as a continuous space rather than this kind of discrete present representation. But that's a very good point. And it was also shown in grammaticality. Could you look at the quality of the parsers that came out? Uh, of this experiment? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this corpus doesn't have uh, the so dependence. Yes, they, uh, I don't know, uh, they, they annotated dependency parts on incorrect sentences rather than the corrected sentence. Um, that is also uh, helpful to analyze the statistics of the dependency, uh, the statistics of learning language learners essay. So how language learners make um, some uh, ungrammatical dependency during writing. But yeah, unfortunately, they don't provide a corrected uh, dependency parsing on the corrected text. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll move on to the last uh, section. Uh, but before that, do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, so the last part is, um, sentence level error correction, and I presented it originally at IGCNRP last uh, December. And the title is uh, Grammatical Error Correction with Neural Reinforcement Learning. Um, so now we are interested in uh, sentence level error correction, and the task is actually very simple. We, the model is going to take uh, ungrammatical sentence as an input, and the model is expected to make it uh, more grammatical and fluent. And, and you can see a similarity between this task to a um, machine translation setting. But uh, one important difference uh, between the two tasks is that the is GC setting, um, the input is always somewhat, uh, already somewhat grammatical and fluent. So sometimes we don't want to change the input. Or uh, well, sometimes the model make the original sentence worse. And this um, is important when it comes to do evaluation. So in the MT setting, you don't usually care about how the original sentence is good or bad. But in this setting, we have to uh, take care of um, if the model makes the original sentence worse or not, or make it better. I, I'll, come put, I'll come back to this uh, after, uh, to this later. So, um, but basically the task is very similar to the machine translation. So it is not surprising that um, we can use neural machine translation models for uh, grammatical error correction, sentence level grammatical error correction. And as, uh, as many of you already know that um, uh, I use the encoder decoder with attention model. Uh, so the encoder takes input sentences uh, one by one. So this is kind of LSTM or RNN. And some, there are some bidirectional uh, edges, and, and we start decoding that uh, produces a token at a time. And in decoding time, you, we usually use attention mechanism, which is basically a weighted sum over the encoder information. And, yep. and um, we just keep going until we get the end of a sentence symbol. So this is how the standard NMT works. 
Um, so usually neural machine translation uses a maximum likelihood estimation as a, as a training objective in which we are going to maximize the log probability over the correct tokens in the, during, the, during the training. Um, but uh, there are some uh, issues or drawbacks in this objective. So first of all, the optimization is made on word level, um, uh, but not a sentence level evaluation. So ultimately, we want to maximize the, the score or something, uh, sentence level score, instead of maximizing the token level uh, probability. So this is our uh, first uh, drawback. And the second issue is that uh, there's, ex there's exposure bias, um, which means that during training, we can look at the gold token and we can use the gold token to predict the next word. Uh, but in the test time, we cannot do this. So once we, um, we fail to predict the correct word, the model is getting worse and worse. So we, we want to avoid this kind of uh, exposure bias during test time. So um, to, in order to address these issues, we um, borrowed an idea from reinforcement learning. In this setting, uh, so we have a decoder here, and we are going to predict a sentence. Uh, we are going to produce a sentence, and uh, we can compute a score. Um, maybe in machine translation, we can use blue. And we can also compute the probability of the output. But the issue is that we cannot do this. Um, we cannot uh, back propagation for this single example because the score function is not always good, uh, differentiable. So what people usually do is um, sample many sentences from the decoder and compute the expected uh, score. And we are going to maximize the expect expected uh, score. Okay. And right. So the partial derivative of this objective function is written as follows. And this is um, called uh, reinforce, uh, originally proposed by uh, Williams in 1982. Uh, and it is written as follows, and we have some parameters called uh, alpha and b. And alpha is a kind of learning rate, and b is a kind of arbitrary baseline. Um, sometimes people use one, or sometimes people use um, expected score. And actually, um, this is, if you are familiar with neural machine translation with minimum risk training, actually this is almost the same. Um, um, if you look at the math more in detail, uh, actually the learning rate alpha in reinforce corresponds to the smoothing parameter in minimum risk training in neural machine translation. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, not going to much detail about this, uh, but if you're interested in, I'm happy to talk about it offline. Okay, uh, so I haven't talked about the score function for grammatical error correction setting. Um, what we used is so-called glue, glue metric. Um, so uh, I think most of you may realize that this is similar to blue. And, uh, okay, uh, but it's, it's very similar, um, except that we have some um, penalty term on the uh, numerator. So we are going to pen penalize some n-grams that overlaps between um, source and uh, hypothesis. So this is hard to yeah, decompose, so I, I just wrote a picture to make it easier to understand. So in blue case, we just look at reference and system output, a hypothesis, and we are going to make um, uh, the intersection large as, as large as possible. So we are pushing hypothesis to be closer to the reference. And in blue, we also do this, but uh, we are, yeah, I mean, we are going to push the hypothesis to close to the reference. And, but at the same time, we want to minimize the, this red area, which is an interse intersection of source and hypothesis, uh, but it's not appearing in the reference. So that means we are going to re uh, try to minimize the n-grams that um, overlaps hypothesis and system output, but not in the reference. So I mean, th the n-grams in this area should be edited or deleted in some way, but the model failed. If the model failed, we cannot reduce this area. So making the hypothesis closer to the reference, at the, and at the same time, we are going to reduce the amount of um, incorrect n-grams that should be corrected. So that's the uh, difference in machine translation and grammatical error correction setting. 
or I think I can say this can be applied to any monolingual sentence rewriting tasks like summarization and some or yeah, summarization is a very similar setting. Okay, so um, here's the uh, experimental details. Um, I think this is not so much um, important. Uh, what I have done is basically I'm using uh, basic standard uh, open sourced uh, Copa for language learners essay. And for, for testing time, we used our own uh, corpus uh, called JFLAG uh, corpus. Um, and the model hyperparameters uh, are set as follows. And yeah, that's basically it. Okay, and here's the result. Um, so the y-axis here is a glue score. Uh, I have explained it before. And as you can see, that source sentence get some score, like a 40. It's not zero. In MT, the source should be zero because it's written in a foreign language. So if the, the, in MT, the source sentence is like Russian and the output is English. So the, the source sentence in blue is always zero. But in our case, the source sentence is already English and somewhat grammatical and fluent. So we get something like this kind of score. And as I said, the model makes sometimes worse. So if the model is terrible, like always producing A or the period, um, we got zero in this case. Um, so here's the, the baselines. Uh, it's basically based on the phrase-based machine translation models. Unfortunately, the models improved uh, the score uh, rather than uh, making it worse. Uh, the, the scores are around 46 to 51. And here's the, the output, the baselines from uh, neural machine translation models trained on uh, <coughs> maximum likelihood estimation. So the token level optimization. Okay, and they got uh, 52 around. Then here uh, is the neural, uh, the, the model in which we, I used uh, reinforced as a training objective. So we are di directly optimizing towards the glue score instead of maximizing the token level uh, likelihood. So it looks, uh, so there are some tiny improvement in glue score. Um, however, uh, if you look at the human reference, um, they are still much better than the neural models. So uh, here is the result. Um, so we also ask humans to evaluate the system outputs in all the uh, systems. And what we found is very similar trend. The source is not good. Um, the phrase level MT and an NMT with uh, maximum likelihood estimation is around like a negative one or something. And the human uh, references evaluate uh, the score is very good in this human evaluation. Right, uh, so here are some uh, examples. Uh, so the source is like this. Um, the older, so here are the outputs from maximum likelihood estimation, and here's the, the model with reinforced. Um, in both cases, they uh, correctly uh, edited the, the first sentence, the f first character is the capital. And yeah, basically, um, actually, I couldn't find any uh, qualitative difference between the Emily and NRL, but I just cherry picked this example. <laughs> All right, um, so here's the quick summary of the talk. Uh, so I talked about um, error correction in NLP in, with three different levels uh, from character level, error correction, and uh, and word level and sentence level uh, correction. Um, okay. Uh, so I think I still have more time, or I can stop here and then do a take questions. Um, okay. So maybe I can add some information uh, which I didn't cover in this talk. Um, so I have also done several other uh, works, uh, something like efficient human judgment collection, which is originally evaluated on uh, machine translation community. And I also made some work on destructed generation for multiple choice questions.
questions. It's more uh, targeted to the language learners to learn vocabulary. And also made some work on automated short answer scoring. And as br I briefly mentioned, the, but uh, I also developed a uh, corpus and evaluation metric for grammatical correction. And yeah, there are the totally different topics I, I did before. As, as summer, fortunately, I have a chance to doing an internship at IBM Watson. And what I have done there is um, uh, question answering with uh, semantic proto role labeling. Uh, pro semantic proto role labeling is a kind of a new, uh, it's a kind of variant of semantic roles role labeling, and I'm happy to talk about it offline if you are interested in. And um, I also worked on uh, information retrieval oriented QA data cura curation with crowdsourcing. Okay, um, I think uh, that's about it, and thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.